Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the New York State Division for Women's Brown Bag Lunch. This is the sixth in our series of informal lunchtime talks uh, with outstanding people in the state government and the community on topics of interest to all, we hope. Today we have with us uh, Mr. David Kaplan. He is a business consultant with the Small Business Division of the New York State Commerce Department. Mr. Kaplan is a World War II navigator in the 8th Air Force. He's a former furniture store owner with a Bachelor of Science in Economics. He has produced a booklet called Your Business for the Division for Small Business as a management guide for people interested in starting operating their own business, which will be his topic today. Uh, we have with us also today the Cable, um, cable Commission, and they are as you can see, recording this event. If you have any problems about being on the um, video, uh, please speak up now and we will try to refrain. They do minimal spanning of the audience for um, the airing. It will be aired on the cable channel eight. And I have a name here and a telephone number. The person to contact when it will be aired is Lee San, L-I-S-A-N-N-E, Powers, and her number is 474-2212. And I'd like to turn you over to Dave Kaplan. Thank you, Judy. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to have been invited by the New York State Division for Women. Um, I understand I'm the first uh, male guest making a presentation. And I'll try not to be chauvinistic in my either attitude or presentation because what I have to say actually is of great concern for people in the business community if they are even thinking or potentially may have an idea in the future of starting their own business. Um, the reason it seems to be such an apparent uh, concern at the present time is that um, we have a great deal of um, business failure as far as the rate of business failure, maybe eight out of 10 businesses within the first few years of operation will succumb and fail. And that seriously impacts upon the economy, not only of our um, local community, but of the state of New York. And that primarily is what our agency, the New York State Department of Commerce, is very concerned about. A healthy economic climate where business can not only start, but be encouraged to grow successfully. We have found, however, that over the years, one of the major contributive causes of the business failures is the proper lack of information that is disseminated to the people who may wish to start their own business. And people lacking experience or the management capability to run their own business ultimately will contribute to the high rise in the business failure rate so that consequently, we feel that um, if there is an opportunity to speak before groups of people who have an idea to go into business, it's very important that we at least present an entree of basic information to guide them in what they should be familiar with if they're going to consider their own business. Now, this is primarily important because regardless of what the state of the economy is, people do, for whatever reason, want to go into their own business. Right now, we have a portend of a potential in the area where businesses may be closing, large businesses may be closing, and people will be laid off. And they have reached a point in time where it is difficult for them to be reindoctrinated or reintroduced into the workforce. So as a consequence, many of these people now are considering the operation of their own business through no choice. Well, that may be an ultimate opportunity for them. At the same time, this type of challenge, unless they're properly prepared, may be a very dramatic decrease in the potential for their ability to survive economically. So more and more, we are encouraging people who, for whatever reason, may be looking for an opportunity for self-employment to contact our agency, the New York State Department of Commerce, so that we can guide them with basic types of information and material 
and the resources that are available to help them. And we feel this is a very important necessity. People sometimes, because of the fact that they need supplemental income, will go into business, their own business. People um, who are laid off, people who are retired, people who have a talent or a particular interest and a particular type of uh, preoccupation, all these are potential candidates for starting your own business, but it's not sufficient. The sufficiency lies in the type of input that's necessary for you to have not only a concept of what you might want to do as a business, but a plan as well that's documented and laid out with specific details as to what you're going to do. I have found in many, many instances, time after time, that the basic lack of knowledge of what people want to do becomes apparent by the type of request for information that we get. In many instances, people will call for basic regulatory information, which is a very simple thing, because what a person has to know to go into business to meet the requirements of the law is necessary. But it's really not that important as a criteria for business success, because meeting the regulatory requirements is only one very small facet of business operation. Knowing the type of business that you want to go into, knowing it to the point where you can be properly capitalized, have the financial resources to start that business, knowing that there is a market that exists for the type of product or service that you're going to be starting. These are important factors that you should lay out and consider before you make the commitment. People will call and say, I have an opportunity to rent, and it's only $500 a month. And they're asking for an opinion of a rental figure without indicating anything else because of the fact that to them that may be a good price. Maybe it's $200 a month or $2,000 a month. It's inconsequential. They are not relating that to the facts of life as to what that business calls for. Now within each industry, depending upon what your particular type of business may be, there are specific ratios, operating ratios, that indicate various factors of operation as to what you should approximately be looking at. For instance, you may be describing what would be a reasonable rental factor for your type of operation, what might be a reasonable cost of goods for your type of operation, what may be a percentage of employment costs for your type of operation. And these ratios that are published by Dun & Bradstreet, by Robert Morris Associates, are the same type of ratios and criteria that banks frequently use when they judge you and the figures that you present to them for your particular type of business. So what you have to do is to develop a very important and documented business plan which describes the entire operation of what you want to do. Now that may sound very insignificant to a lot of you, but when I keep getting calls from people asking me, what's a good type of business to get into, Mr. Kaplan? I mean, that to me triggers a very serious concern as to the capability and knowledge and interest of a person as to why they would even consider going into their own business. If they are asking me what type of business to go into, what they want to know really is, you know, what's a good successful type of business? And actually, other than gambling or prostitution, I really don't know of anything that I could recommend. So that as a consequence of that, we have a serious problem. They, in their own minds, people who are interested in going into business, have to define the nature of really what they are going to do. The product that they're interested in selling, or the service that they're interested in providing. And it's very important for them to understand that they know something about what they're going to do and to determine or predetermine as much as they can what type of market for that product or service they want to attract. Now, how do they know really whether or not the world, for whatever reason, has survived without their product or service existing as a business before. 
It has existed before they went into business. So what makes the person who wants to go into business all of a sudden feel that the market is there and people who formerly were buying that service from somebody else or buying that product from somebody else will now be interested in getting that product or service from that new business. How do they know that? Well, very sadly, most people don't even predetermine who their market is, where their market exists, or what potential market exists for the type of service that they're actually going to go into. Now, recent case and points relating to that are indicated by the frequency of the calls that I'm now getting. What are the calls that I'm now getting as to the nature of the business? Several calls almost daily come in. I want to start a TV rental business. Why a TV rental business? Well, we all know that, uh, I guess, VCR equipment, I don't have it myself, but I understand they're very popular in sales. People go in, they rent a film, and they have their evening's entertainment without leaving their home. And by and large, their observation is correct. It is a rising incidence of use. People are renting this type of item, and it is becoming a popular type of business. What the average person doesn't understand is you just don't take advantage of a particular trend without knowing the nature and the ramifications of the business. What's the competition that exists in this type of business today? You can go into any grocery store, any little mini supermarket, any gas station, any drug store, besides the legitimate type of operations that are providing this type of item and service for the public. So what makes you think that in your particular area where you intend to open this TV uh, rental type of uh, business, that you would be successful in having a market for it? God knows the chances are they didn't actually test to determine whether or not there is a market for this type of item, or who their customers will be, or if they know anything about the selection of the type of films that they would want. They only know what their own tastes are. So unless you really fully are capable of understanding the market and the industry in which you're selecting, it's better to do more research than to be impetuous in starting something that you really don't know that much about merely because of the fact that you have a personal interest. Any more than it's possible for you because of the fact that you dress so well and people always compliment you on the fact that you look so nice, why you should open up an apparel shop or the fact that you're the world's best cook. And I always loved your cooking, but that doesn't make you a successful restaurant operator or anything like that that relates to the talent or the capability or the skills or, te or um, capabilities that you have in other areas. Because the people that fix automobiles or fix appliances, they service plumbing needs or electrical needs, could be excellent candidates for potential operators of service businesses. But the skills that they have and can use successfully for running their own business is a very small facet of business. Guiding a business by knowing what it is to control the expenses of a business, to get the business, to charge proper prices to meet the competition, to advertise to attract the type of people to your particular location, to provide the resources necessary for filling in your inventory and having the resources and the capability of having money there to pay your bills in a timely fashion, to understand what it means to have sufficient cash in against the cash going out to keep a satisfactory cash flow. Principles of business management that this very successful, talented person in their own field has, but cannot match that with the management capabilities necessary to run your own business. They have to be matched. I have no expertise or no talent that can compare with any of the service people or people who can paint or people who can create crafts or anything else. The only skill that I have is in guiding people as far as what they should know to run a business. But what I know and what they know, if they can at least match some of the information, 
on resources that are available that contains this type of information. And there's a wealth of information for people to have available to them to learn the business part. That also can be an easy part. Developing a skill is a natural attribute that very few of us have. To get down to some of the basic considerations that people have to make if they have decided as to the nature of the type of business that they want to go into and have determined, yes, there is a market. Is it a market that extends beyond their immediate neighborhood location or is it strictly a neighborhood operation? They have to decide on coming up with facts and figures so that they can understand what the needs of that business will be. And the way they project these needs is primarily in what they call pro forma statements that include two types of accountability of their business. One in the form of an income statement. By accountants, they refer to it as a profit and loss statement. And the other, a balance sheet. A profit and loss statement is actually an indication of what you as a business person are projecting for a specific period of time. So that in a quarter or a semi-annual period or an annual period or an annual period for several years, you are projecting what your sales anticipation will be for that new untested business. Contrary to that, if you're starting a business from someone else's operation, you are buying someone else's business, then you already have a history of judgment that you can make as to the type of volume or sales that you will make in that business. Because you know that if you take over from somebody else's operation and they're doing X number of dollars in volume, you will probably do X number of volume, this similar to what they have done. But in a new business, the projection has to be based upon what your mind feels is a realistic amount of dollars in sales you can realize by your operation. And you do this based upon your knowledge of that business. Is it a business that's going to have to draw from the public seven days a week, six days a week, five days a week? And it can vary. Most retail operations, for instance, are seven-day operations. They're six-night operations, six-night openings a week if you're in the retail. But contrary to that, we have a limited retail area within this particular geographic periphery that's only open five days a week. No night openings. Why? Because their market exists among employees that are nine to five employees. When those employees that are their market leave, their business dies. I'm talking about the businesses in this area that are drawing from the state workers. So you have to know the area and the market from which you're going to draw. Not just the fact that endemic to retailing, you have to figure out what you can do seven days a week, six night openings. Because if you're in this area, that's not gonna be your business. You can open at eight or nine in the morning and stay open till five or six at night or nine o'clock at night, but probably between the hours of 11 and two, you'll do 90 to 95% of your business in this area for those types of businesses. And that's what you have to make judgments on. Now, there are other considerations that you have to make when you go into business. And a lot of those considerations have to do with uh, tax considerations, convenience considerations, employment considerations. The form of business organization that you elect to operate under, for instance. Are you going under your own resources as a sole proprietor? because of the fact that you're the one that knows the business and you will be the one that will be operating the business as a sole proprietor. It's the easiest method of going into business. It's perhaps the least costly and the most popular. The preponderant number of businesses that start and are operating in this world today are sole proprietors, individuals operating their businesses. Or for whatever reason, you may want one or more people to operate with you under a partnership. And under that type of um, agreement, there are other requirements and other considerations. The third and the 
most um, perhaps frequently referred to was the corporate stratus, uh, pardon me, the corporate status where you incorporate your business and it becomes a separate entity apart from what you are as an individual. And people sometimes elect that type of um, form of business organization without knowing the consequences or the ramifications. They may know the costs, but they don't know the consequences. Tax considerations, obligations, reporting requirements, or anything else. There are many sources of information that describe advantages and disadvantages of these forms of business organizations. But let me just basically give you a brief outline of a couple of simple considerations that you can make. I indicated to you that the sole proprietorship, which is the easiest form to operate under, is the most popular, and it is. And the reason that it is is because most people are in, interested in starting their own operation for themselves because they don't want to be involved with anyone else. Or they may have the resources to do it on their own, or they don't want the obligation of sharing what they feel is a good opportunity, or for whatever reason. But if you do go in on your own, a lot of people feel that I'm obligating myself because if anything happens, they will take everything that I own. And that's a very familiar type of response that I get as to why they're going into this form of organization versus another form of business organization. And the reason that I say that is because many people who have incorporated tell me that the reason that they have incorporated is so that they can eliminate the personal liability factor and they don't have to worry about losing their house or their car or their jewelry or their girlfriend or boyfriend. They're free and clear because the corporation is a separate entity and when the corporation is sued, the only loss that you can incur is that amount of monies that you have invested in the corporation. But that also may be a misconception. And the reason that it can be a misconception is there are several types of liability. First we'll talk about the liability of money, not a liability of injury, but a liability of money if you're going out to borrow money and you're going out to borrow money as a corporation, and you feel that if anything happens, they're gonna sue the corporation so that at least I'm free and clear. They can't take my house or these other personal assets that I have. And the reason I say it may be a misconception is that if a business is new, and it is a corporate status, it is true that it still is a separate entity. But what is also equally true is that a loan officer of any lending agency, whether it be a bank or a government lending agency or anything else, looks at the financial structure of that corporation. And if it's a new corporation and it's insufficiently capitalized, the chances are 99 out of 100 that personal signatures will be required of the principles of that corporation. So you've accomplished what you thought was a fact, but is now not a fact, because if anything happens, your personal signature will also be acted upon by that lending agency if you go down the tube. And the other part about it is, in the personal injury type of liability, which you can also cover yourself with insurance if you are a sole proprietor, even though a corporation is usually that particular entity which is sued, if there's contributive negligence on the part of the officers, or if there's a fraudulent act on the part of the officers, then individuals, the owners of the corporation, can also be personally held liable. So the corporate status for this particular reason may or may not be a valid point of consideration. And I bring that up because I hear it so many times, is this is the reason that I elected this particular type of form of business organization, the corporate status because there can be another danger to the corporation which sometimes is and is not pointed out to the individuals. A corporation is something that um, is granted as a franchise 
permission to operate under that status by the Department of State. When you are granted this permission by the Department of State, at such and such a date, there is a minimum franchise corporation tax for that business, whether he makes money or whether or not that business, he or she, doesn't make money. There is a minimum $250 corporation tax for that year. And if a corporation elects a fiscal period from the point in which they are granted that to a, a different period, I'll give you a case in point. The other day, a corporation was granted permission to operate around the 1st of November. And they elected for the convenience sake to start from January 1st to December 31st, that calendar period, because it was more convenient. And most people do uh, account for their business during that calendar period, rather than from November the 1st to October 31st of that following year. That new corporation was held liable for the corporation minimum franchise tax by the state of New York from November the 1st until December the 31st. So for those two months of operation, they had to pay the minimum corporation franchise tax, which now, incidentally, is prorated, so they only had to pay half a year. But that's, that's as far as it goes. We've tried to encourage further incremental granting of credit so that if it's only four months, they would only pay a quarter. But people have to also be aware of that. And sometimes, for whatever reasons, the accountant or the attorney is not quite aware of the fact that this is one of the nuances of the state corporation law, and the tax department picks up on it, and you have to file in that particular manner. But the reason I mention that is that many people who want to incorporate find a loophole in the fact that they will avoid the expense, what they call expense of incorporation, by not hiring an attorney. A two-paid certificate of incorporation is purchased in any legal stationery store, and any individual can go into the Department of State and for a certain amount of money incorporate himself or herself as an individual and become a corporation. The services of a lawyer are not required under the law. However, there are so many nuances in setting up a corporation properly for the future of your operation that people are encouraged never to even consider that without proper guidance. And that's the reason that I mention this particular nuance of the law, because if you don't have the resources to hire an attorney, if you don't have the resources to hire an accountant, then you have to do all this research on yourself, because improperly done can be one of the pitfalls that will do you in. And our job is to encourage you to be properly informed as to what's necessary to operate your business satisfactorily. Before I open up for questions, I want to cover a brief a moment or two on the financing of a business, because that's very important. The proper capitalization, or improper capitalization of a business, if you will, is one of the serious pitfalls of doing businesses in. Most people, for whatever reason, when they make their projections to determine what their business needs will be, always seem to overestimate the amount of sales or the volume of business that they will accomplish within that period of time. So that they project an annual volume of $100,000, hypothetically, Realistically, probably within that first year, they may or may not reach 60, 70, 80 percent of that anticipated projection. I'm not saying that in all cases. The preponderant cases is to overestimate your sales. Conversely, when you're determining what your expenses are in this profit and loss statement that I mentioned, where you have your sales, your cost of goods sold, and all the incumbent expenses to operate that business, your employees' help, your advertising, your rent, heat, light, telephone, insurance, et cetera, the chances are you are underestimating those expenses. And that creates a problem 
called a cash flow problem because actually much less money is coming in than you anticipated because you're doing less sales. And your expenses have to be paid in a timely fashion. And a deficiency of cash flow can put a very potentially successful business into jeopardy. So I'm advising people to be very careful in their analysis of what their financial requirements are. Now there are resources to help you in that regard. One of the recently established resources is the Small Business Development Center in Albany. And Mr. Peter George of the Small Business Development Center in Albany is one of several accountants, qualified CPAs, who can help you in that regard. And even though they're several weeks behind, if you want to consider the use of their services, it's 442-5577. Additionally, the Small Business Administration, which is a federal lending agency, and I'll just touch upon a couple of their loans in a moment, have what they call a SCORE program, Service Corps of Retired Executives. And these retired executives have proficiency in particular types of business operations. And this expertise is available as a free service by the SBA, the Small Business Administration, by requesting a SCORE counselor. And there is a form required to get a SCORE counselor, which must be completed and returned to the Small Business Administration. Locally, the Small Business Administration office is in Albany on Broadway in the post office building on the second floor. 472-6300 is the Small Business Administration office. And you can request an application for a SCORE counselor or you can talk about their loans. I'll talk about two loan programs. When you go in for a loan in any financial institution, there are practical points of interest that you have to be familiar with. The type of information that a loan officer will look for. And these are the type of financial statements that you have to be prepared to present because it's documentation of the type of business that you prepare in anticipation of running this specific type of business. And those documents will include the operating statement, the profit and loss statement. It will include the balance sheet. The balance sheet is merely a statement of what you own and what you owe, your assets and your liabilities, your assets of tangible value, your liabilities of obligations that are owed to others, plus the equity that you have in the business. And one balances the other. Hopefully your equi equity will be something because when you go in for a loan to a bank, most banks look for a 50-50 situation. A 50-50 point of equity means that if it's a $100,000 deal, they would expect you to have half because people are under a misapprehension that they can go in and get 100% financing. 100% financing does happen infinitesimally under very special, extraordinary circumstances. Your chances of that are practically um, as much opportunity as winning the lottery. So you have to be prepared with the type of documentation. In the booklet that I mentioned that is a management guide, on the chapter of finance, there is information in there on the type of documentation necessary to obtain that loan. So I would suggest that if you're serious or considering going into a business, that you either obtain or call the Department of Commerce for a copy of this booklet, Your Business. It's a management guide that covers all the various facets of business operation. It is a very concise, easily perused booklet. It's not a difficult text. And if you read through that, you will get the basic guidelines of what you should be familiar with. Regulatory information is obtained from the Office of Business Permits. That's referred to in this booklet. There is uh, special brochures that I have from them, but their office numbers are also in this booklet. Both the local number and the toll-free number. Our number, incidentally, locally, if you need the booklet, is 474-7756. This is the Small Business Division of the New York State Department of Commerce. 
Um, in closing, I just want to mention a couple of the type of services that our small business division has available for you people if you do want to operate or are operating your own business. We provide an advocacy service for people so that those who are involved in business that have difficulty with regulatory agencies, we will act as your ombudsperson to help you with these particular problems. We conduct workshops throughout the state of New York on various subjects of interest to small businesses. Additionally, one of our most successful and perhaps most effective program to date in our small business division is an opportunity for small businesses in the state of New York to sell their products or services to the state of New York or to the federal government. One of my colleagues who is present now, Mrs. Um, uh, Curitz, is from that procurement staff, and the number that I gave you, 474-7756, is available for assistance from her unit, the procurement unit of the Small Business Division, which will help you and guide you with the proper information and procedure to sell your product or service to the state of New York or the federal government. They have a great deal of information and material in that regard. I'd like to leave a few moments. Um, if any of you do have any questions of some of the information that I might have uh, spoken about, or if you would like to bring up any subject material, if not, I can continue. If you've got three or four more hours, I'd be glad to uh, continue talking. Uh, it's Marion Curitz. She has her card with her also. K-U-R-I-T-Z. Yes? Would you have any advice um, with respect to setting up a business but which involves a professional service? Is there any particular advice? Uh, most professional services um, uh, that I have uh, assisted start, if you're talking about as a form of business organization, they start as what they call a professional corporation. And uh, for whatever reason, that seems to be the most potentially popular. They are perhaps a very select group, different from what I described as those who go in under a sole proprietorship type of operation. They do incorporate. Now, there is another form of business organization as a uh, subheading under the corporate status, and that's the S chapter, where you're actually filing either as an individual or as a partnership. And that S corporation is only available with permission and authorization by the Internal Revenue Service after you have incorporated. You must be incorporated initially. So you will have to go through that procedure with the Department of State. And between what type of guidance that you can get from your attorney and your accountant. Remember, even though there may be costs involved with incorporation, it's a very satisfactory method as a form of business organization, particularly if the business is anticipating a high return of income. And there are certain types of medical professions or other type of professional um, offices consulting offices that have the potential to be economically successful. And actually, um, this type of route may be the better way to go, the corporate status for tax purposes. Yes, Dr. Simon? You said that some people incorporate with the mistaken idea that may be shielding themselves from certain types of liability. That's correct. Uh, the sole proprietorship is the most popular form. What are the liabilities and risks of that, and how do you protect yourself against those without going through the incorporation route? You don't protect yourself against the money factor any more than you can in a new corporation, because you will probably have to give a personal s signature if you borrow monies from a lending institution. The liability factor of personal injury um, is probably the only resource that the corporation has is the same as the sole proprietor, and that's through insurance. And that's one of the reasons why your insurance uh, carrier today, your insurance representative,
for whatever reason, and more so today than ever before, is a very important factor as an advice giver to your business, along with your lawyer, your accountant, and your banker. Your insurance agent is very important because with one or more employees in New York State, you are required and subject to unemployment insurance laws, workers' comp, and disability laws. They have to be covered. And that's in addition to the withholding of federal and state taxes and your contributive share in the withholding of Social Security. Individuals also who are self-employed must, of course, pay their own taxes, and they have to be paid on an estimated quarterly basis. You don't wait until the end of the year to pay your taxes. You can, but you will have an imposition of very severe penalties as a consequence. So you pay not only your federal taxes, you also pay your self-employment taxes. And today, the self-employment tax of people in business for themselves is at the rate of 11.8% versus an employment tax, an employee tax of 705, that's Social Security. Any other questions? I'd just like to make a comment. Um, for any of those who heard, oh, sell to the government, sell to the state, sell to the uh, federal government, that's a big market. I can really do Marianne, a job. Marianne, would you speak a little louder? They're trying to pick you up. I can really do a job selling to the government. Let me just caution you, uh, encourage you, and caution you. I don't want to discourage at all. But to those of you who are not already in business, I suggest that you establish a track record. Get your act together, get your business up and running. The government loves to do business with women-owned, minority-owned, small businesses. Their, um, the federal government has strong programs to support that effort. However, they also like you to be in business long enough to deliver the product and to deliver the service. That is also their goal, is to get the stuff on the shelf on time. So please, if you are not in business now, let government procurement go for a good year to two years until after you are well established, have some concept of your own limitations and capabilities and direction. You might find yourself going in a different direction later on. If you don't and you are still interested in procurement, we're available. Any other question? Yeah. Um, does your division help persons that are involved with nonprofit organizations that we, are incorporated? We do help all businesses. However, um, probably because of the fact that um, we do have limited resources and we are interested in the general wel welfare of the economy, most of the people that we do, we don't discriminate against anyone. So that in answer to your question, yes. But most of the businesses that we do assist are profit motivated. And uh, I think you can understand that because people who do go into business primarily are people who will be making a living from this. It's very fortunate those who do this as a supplemental means and they have another resource, another income, which they don't have to worry about whether the business has sufficient monies so that they don't have to live off of the business. A business in its early stages much, must be nurtured, must be tended, and um, it demands so much attention that the normal business person isn't aware of the fact that this is not a nine to five type of preoccupation. Being your own business person could demand much more in a relationship than a boy-girl relationship, a husband-wife, or what have you. And the results of the non-attention, rather than a divorce, will create a situation where that business will fail. Because whether it takes 60 hours a week or 80 hours a week or 100 hours a week to make that business properly grow and give it the attention that it needs is up to your type of commitment. Now that's true of perhaps non-for-profit as well as profit businesses. There has to be a lot of dedication and self-sacrifice that's why I also tell people that certain personal characteristics of being your own business persons are necessary. You have to try to take care of your health because there are a lot of hourly demands on a business person. There's a lot of stress on a business person. And these hours, extending over sometimes to seven days a week, take its toll unless you are properly um, in the type of condition to withstand the toll that business demands will take upon you. Is there anyone else that? Uh... Uh, Mr. Campbell, 
I was wondering, just a point of clarification, did you say that um, obtaining a DBA statement from one of the local stores, such as uh, Shanks, I believe? I didn't mention the term DBA, uh, actually. You probably heard it from me either on the telephone or somebody else. Uh, just say doing business as, it's not that well, necessary. Well, I didn't use the acronym, but what, what you're saying is correct. A DBA is a form necessary to be filed. If you as an individual or you as a partner, both, both forms of business organizations under the general business law require the filing of what this lady referred to as a DBA, doing business as Jane Smith, doing business as DBA, Albany Coiffures, or whatever name you're going under, other than your own name. And the requirement is that that DBA form be filed in the county clerk's office where your principal office will be located. The form itself is usually available from a legal stationery store. And there are many of them in the Albany area. That is not the same as an incorporation, though. No, an incorporation is a different filing requirement with the New York State Department of State. A DBA can be filed by individuals, and it is not a difficult form to complete. I believe that most county clerk's office today where the DBA forms are filed have a $25 filing fee, which has recently been raised to 25 Are there any? Yes. Most people don't file DBAs if they are incorporated. Some people do still file a DBA in the county clerk's office. It is not required. Um, I had one question, and that was you said there's uh, information on market trends. Where, uh, would you have that information on the current trends and the particular markets that someone might be interested in uh, enterprising? Or uh, I'm sure there's something at the library. Is there some well, books that you could suggest? Well, actually, we, we have um, a lot of market information in our department. The New York State Department of Commerce has a unit of research and statistics that has a lot of demographics that would be of interest to people relating to market data that could help in the determination of perhaps whether location would be proper in a particular area. The population, the income, the housing, the, um, the gender mix, things of that sort. And the statistical um, information available from our um, department in that regard could be very helpful. But other type of market information uh, is also available from trade organizations that are very um, interested in promoting their type of industry on a successful basis so that people in the travel agency business, the American Society of Travel Agents, for instance, as a, as a trade organization, will provide a great deal of information on market trends. The um, liquor industry has a great deal of, um, and their trade organization has a great deal of information that they disseminate to the liquor store operators on trends of buyers of liquor products. They will indicate, for instance, that the liquor versus the wine market has been reversed dramatically in the last several years. People turning from the hard to the wine drinks. And consequently, people in the liquor industry are uh, more prone now to balance their inventory more toward wine than toward liquor. Incidentally, when you talk about market studies, one of the favorable characteristics that New York State provides, even though people aren't aware of it, it's a licensing requirement. If you operate a liquor store, you're required through your local alcoholic beverage control board to apply to the State Liquor Authority for a license. If for whatever reason you're denied a license and you get the notice of declination and Oh, those son of a guns, they turned me down. But they provided a very valuable service for you, even though you don't know it, because they have done a market study that has determined that in that geographic location in which you had anticipated opening your liquor store, there were existing liquor store operations that would satisfy the needs of that market area. That's a very valuable service. You may not realize it. We don't do it for anybody else. 
so that I'm not encouraging people to go into the liquor business, but it's one of the things that uh, is available, actually. Uh, there are also, I did bring a few descriptive brochures of our division that describes the services that we provide with various names and contacts so that if you wanted to avail yourself, you could take one of each of these sheets. If any of you are interested in going into your own business and would want a copy of your business, I did bring a few copies so you can avail yourself of those. I brought a few points of literature from the SBA and the Office of Business Permits. The Office of Business Permits will give you the necessary regular in, um, information on what permits or licenses are required for your specific operation. The Small Business Administration in closing, this federal agency, I didn't get an opportunity to touch. But in order to be eligible for a Small Business Administration loan, which is available from the federal agency, from people who have exhausted the resources of normal lending institutions, so that if you've been turned down by a bank, for instance, or two banks, which is a prerequisite requirement by the SBA before you're allowed to apply under their guaranteed loan program. Their guaranteed loan program will allow you to apply for a loan that's been rejected by the bank and will probably be giving you consideration for monies <clears throat> where your equity position is not as strong as it was required by the bank. If you're turned down under the guaranteed loan program, they do have a direct loan program, which you can apply under. These are the two current programs that are most popular and most available. In closing, being that this is an organization that is uh, primarily uh, inclusive and sponsored by the Division of Women, for women, I will say this for women, that when it comes time to capitalizing your business, and you hear all kinds of assistance for women in business, there is no pool of money that is separately established as a resource for you to go in and have money available to you. There is no pool of money set aside for this purpose that I'm aware of. If there is, I'm not aware of it. What there is, is among the various lending institutions, a policy of non-discrimination so that Jane Smith will have equal opportunity and access for getting a loan the same as Joe Smith. But it is not a separate pool of money. You, in other words, will be qualified and judged and evaluated and a decision made based upon your capabilities to repay the loan. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Does that mean that when you said about the SBA that the interest rates will be higher than the banks which you would turn down? The, no, the bank um, will be handling the paper for the Small Business Administration, and currently the SBA is charging something roughly two points over prime. Um, if there are no other questions, I just want to say in closing that um, for me, it's always a pleasure to have an opportunity regardless of the limited attendance. And I hope it will be um, larger in attendance at future meetings if um, I will ever have another privilege to be invited because of the fact that this is something that is a resource for people who are going into business, the New York State Department of Commerce. And too few people really do know ab about us. And if they are made aware of the fact that we have an office in Albany, as well as throughout the state of New York, we have regional offices that are listed on the back of the booklet, Your Business, so that anybody in any part of New York State has the services of our department, all the services of our department, available to them. And we're pleased to help. Because remember, if we can provide you with service and hopefully and happily make your business successful, we've accomplished a contribution toward keeping New York State's economy healthy. And for that, I thank you for allowing me this opportunity. If you have any other questions, I'll be around for several moments. Mm -hmm. If you want, please avail yourself of some of the literature that I brought. OK, thank you very much, David. Thank you all for coming. The next brown bag is Judith Condo from the Albany County Rape Crisis Center. I have some flyers on that.